Thank you. <laughs> hey, so um, icebreakers are real. Uh, journey. I didn't think I was going to end up in the outdoor industry. It's a bit of a love affair. Um, you can see why. You know, the energy in this room is what the industry is all about. And I love the kind of seamless connection between people who work in the industry and the, and the genuine connection with our customers and what we love doing. I used to work in market research and the reason I wanted to start my own business was because I was paid to tell other people about their customers. So I was kind of trying to find something that was, you know, an, an authentic connection between myself and my friends and the type of work that I wanted to do. So I've been asked just to tell a little bit of a story about some of the, um, I don't know, stuff <laughs> along the way. So I'm going to dance all over the, uh, dance over the place a little bit. I'll start with the compulsory baby photo. <laughs> yes, that's my son, uh, Max. Okay, so um, this is a book I read called The Seven Basic Plots. Um, I love this book. Has anyone read this book? Okay, go and buy it. Um, it's, it's a story about humanity and how we live through stories. And... Uh, I've also got three daughters and you know you grow up and you read them stories and they have kind of recurring themes so some of those themes are up there overcoming uh, the monster or rebirth or tragedy so I'm going to go through a couple of themes that relate to Icebreaker so the first theme was this idea of quest there's all these stories about a quest so my personal quest was because I live in New Zealand uh, which is uh, not Australia. Uh, thanks though, thank you. No, we like Australia, but it's uh, different. Um, for the first three years I'd come to America and people would go, yeah, I love, uh, I love New Zealand, I've been to Sydney. I'd go, uh, um, anyway, it's not like that now. So um, the quest that I was on, because we live so far away, was to build an international business from New Zealand that had some kind of human values that were actually beyond my country. Um, when I grew up, I travelled through Europe with my family when I was four, and I lived in the US when I was 10 and when I was 12. And we'd travel and, and live in a camper van through Europe on the way home. And I kind of grew, grew up understanding the world was a small place. And I go like that because being New Zealand, North America, Europe and Asia was kind of a pattern. So what I was trying to do was find a way to uh, live like that. So my way, my quest was an international business. This is actually what triggered it. So I met a merino wool farmer who threw me uh, these t-shirts. So they're probably not the most beautiful things you've ever seen. But the experience I had when I put them on was beautiful. Um, I'd been uh, kayaking and mountain biking with some friends. We're in polypropylene just before this for five days, and anyone that's worn polypropylene for more than about, no one still uses that, do they? <laughs> um, for more than about you know, a day, realizes that there's real problems, right? So here I was with a problem to solve, I stink, and given a t shirt that felt kind of luxurious and exciting and was natural. So that's what kind of triggered the quest in a way. It didn't look very exciting. Um, my background really was in um, cultural anthropology, which is trying to understand the meaning that we as humans give objects and how we use those objects to reflect either who we are or who we want to be. So the challenge was to take a fiber, or a fabric actually, that had intrinsic goodness, because when I put it on, it felt amazing, it had incredible technical qualities, and it didn't have any of the problems of the old wool that I used to have. It wasn't itchy and heavy, I could throw it in the washing machine, it didn't have the problems of synthetics, it wasn't made from plastic and it didn't stink. And it was about trying to work out how do you then craft something which is authentic, a reflection of the fibre, and also of the purpose. So that's kind of the brand side of the business. That's what we're actually trying to do in a fun and creative way. So obviously we had a bit of work to do um, from that. 
Well, this is the first business plan I wrote in 1994 when I was 24. Um, I was broke. Uh, I had to raise $20,000 to um, buy the idea from the farmer. I told the bank that I needed to put a new kitchen in my house, a remortgage in my house. The only reason I had a house was because I got evicted from the previous place. I raised 20 grand, quit my job, and it, for me it felt like if this didn't work, um, well actually I kind of lost the right for it not to work. And because I was 24 and didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that the fibre had so much intrinsic goodness, my mantra was, this will work if I don't screw it up. Genuinely, that was what was going through my head. This will work if I don't screw it up. So how do you not screw it up? And I remember there was a paper I did at university and it said businesses fail for three reasons. One, you run out of cash. So I ran all my friends and tried to speak to their parents if they were in business and raised um, $200,000 from eight investors. And a couple of those people joined me as directors and uh, right until this year, 18 years on, I've had two amazing mentors through that whole journey. So that was the second thing. You run out of cash and you don't have enough management experience. I had no idea what I was doing. So I've spent my whole life trying to surround myself with people who know what they're doing. Um, and the third uh, reason businesses fail is if they don't have a differentiated idea. So I basically spent half of that cash just on design on brand identity and trying to shift the product from being something like that that felt really good but no one was going to touch to something that was um, relevant. And the beauty was, because I didn't know what I was doing, I could ask lots of questions. So that kind of led to the second big theme from that book. The story of humanity is often about overcoming the monster, they say. So great brands actually need something to fight against. So I love the fact that lots of people in this uh, room uh, work for companies that use a lot of synthetics because I wear synthetics, I wear Gore-Tex and it's, there's a place. But there was this huge gap in the market about what you're going to wear against your skin. And every great brand needs something to fight against. You know, if you think about when Richard Branson started Virgin, he fought against you know, the authority of British Airways, or whatever it is. So, for us it was firstly about telling this untapped story about an animal that was born in the mountains that over thousands of years had created a fibre to protect it. So there was this kind of, there was this deep innovation story, but the innovation actually came from nature. And that was inspiring for me because it triggered a whole lot of thoughts around how nature works. And we'll get into some of that stuff a bit later. So there were very powerful stories. This is a merino station. Um, and this is what we did. We'd bring people over. Lisa, is that you? Hello. Yeah, so that's Lisa in 1997, 1998, um, with a guy, Jim Murray. So Jim's a farmer, and he taught us about his relationship with the animals and how it came up. So we had this the beginnings of the strong backstory about where it came from, as well as how it worked. And this is uh, last week on another marina station with some of the new people that are in the room uh, today. So um, we had to take that and also have some fun with it, because remember the other thing was that it needed to be differentiated. So I surrounded myself with really creative people and we created new imagery that was actually quite shocking and unusual for the outdoor industry. And the point of this at the time was, it wasn't so much if you liked it or not, I needed to be different. Because the brands that we were competing against back then were all pretty much, you know, this is in the 90s, so all pretty much telling the same story. Men climbing mountains as quickly as possible, right? It was all about that. So we tried to make it gender equal, we tried to make it about kinship with nature. And icebreaker really is a metaphor of icebreaking. It's the story of relationships. So, and a new relationship that we created about using natural fibers. So the categories that we're into, you'll be pretty familiar with. 
Um, but we just kind of did our own version of that. And the point of the company really was to offer um, an inspired choice from nature. It's another daughter. <laughs> okay, so third one. Another theme is rags to riches. So um, this is only important because it shows that the company is on a bit of a growth trend. That's super important because if we're not actually selling product, we're not connecting with our consumers. So we use sales as the metrics of conversion. And this is really what Icebreaker is. We're actually a collection of small businesses. So um, there's 410 of us spread across uh, nine different sites around the world. You'll see uh, fantastic Portland there, as well as we've got teams uh, throughout Europe and Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Um, Okay, so the next one then is this theme of tragedy and rebirth. So when you read so many of the old novels, it was always, you know, there'd often be a tragedy and there'd be some sort of rebirth that came out of it. And even though when you look back on that, it looks pretty smooth, doesn't it? Well, it was absolutely nothing like that, I can promise you. <laughs> nothing like that. Peter Travers, who was the director, said, when you're running a small business, you have more highs and lows in a month than most people have in a year. I remember our very first batch of production, I went down to the factory, I was very excited. It was blue and white. Um, it wasn't actually white, it was yellow, because they left it in the machine too long. So we created a new colour in our collection called Buttercup, um, that we had to uh, deliver to our retailers, which would have been fine if they'd fitted, because what happens was, the very first production run, we rolled the fabric two sides onto the machine, got it unrolled, cut all the pieces out, perfectly to spec, and overnight they all contracted about 20%. So we had our first range, our first collection for 10 year olds. <laughs> um, and the whole story, my life for seven years was nothing but kind of breakthrough and breakdown, but this funny thing happened where it just became normal and kind of part of it. And because over time we always were collecting more and more inspired, strong people, Lisa walked in as employee number four when you were 19. The re she got the job for two reasons. Well, three actually. A, she was super cool. B, she had gold stars on her resume. <laughs> and thirdly, she was the only person who applied for the job. <laughs> but as we were battling through, you just kind of this pulse of trying to work it out became quite normal and it feels like nothing is insurmountable if we have a clear sense of what's going forward. So the work we've been doing this week is about recreating the future for ourselves. It's a choice, right? And all we know is that whatever got us to where we are right now is not going to get us to where we want to be in the future the impact we want to have on our customers, and the impact that we think we can contribute to making in the outdoor industry as it looks for new ways of working and being more sustainable. So, which kind of comes to the next idea then of this waves of change. So, as well as it being a collection of small businesses, we're actually this kind of rebirthing process that we're constantly in. And you probably go through it in your own life, right? Everything's settled, things begin to get a bit shaky, and then two, every two or three years, I don't know about you, but I kind of have to shed my skin a little bit and rethink about who I want to be for the people I'm working with, my family, for my friends, in order to be the person that you need to be to create the future that you're committed to. So we're at a very exciting time right now because we've had a really great milestone until where we've got to, but the entire future of the company is going to be determined by the people that we're bringing into the business right now, and the choices that we're making. And they're genuine choices. And they're choices that a lot of you will be facing in your personal life, or even in your business life. You know, if you're a wholesale-driven company, do you set up your own retail stores? How do you do that in a way which is integrated around your customer? What's the role of e-commerce? How much should we be spending on social media? How do you do it authentically? All those exciting dilemmas that didn't exist three or four years ago, that no one has all the answers to, but everyone are kind of restlessly trying to, to take on. 
So it's really fun when no one has a... Put, put your hand up if you've got all the answers, right? No one does. We're all trying to work it out. And the industry that we're in is in such a great stage at the moment. We've got new, passionate people entering the industry. We've got people coming from other industries that want to reconnect with something authentic, with something which is soulful, and with something which is actually good for humanity and good for the planet, being active and being connected to nature. And this amazing convergence of trends as fashion hits function, and all the old categories that used to exist, they don't exist anymore. And everything, in terms of the future of all our businesses, or all choices, around the extent to which we can imagine that future. So it doesn't matter who you work for, the impact you can individually have on creating those choices with your teams and with, the, and with your customers and with the broader t uh, company that you're working for, it is all transformative. We are at such a transformative phase right now. This is a little model that was transformative for me. We drew it on a whiteboard in about six minutes seven years ago, but I love it, so I just thought I'd share it with you. All it is is, kind of looks at two, imagine these are two circles. The back end of the business is the whole relationship with your supply chain. Um, and the front end of the business is the whole relationship with your customer. So the amazing thing, like you prob well some of you may have heard of this idea that we launched uh, four or five years ago called Barcode. We can enter the barcode from your icebreaker and visit marino stations that have grown the fibre. The whole idea of that was about connecting people with the source, which was actually about families, 187 families in New Zealand that cover 4 million acres of the Southern Alps that uh, produce about 1,600 tonnes of pure marino for us every year. And what happened with that process is, what I learned was um, how you define your business defines what you take responsibility for as a company. So it might, and so many companies, you know, five years ago, and less and less now, we're using kind of agents to create obscurity. But the principles behind this of knowing where it comes from, knowing where it comes from, letting your customers look under the hood, um, and then being proud of uh, what you do, as well as trying to link in with some really clear standards that we can promise our customers. Um, that for me was inspiring because it was this uh, gauge from which to uh, measure all our future decisions by. Because vision and creativity is one thing, but the values and the ethos are its natural uh, brother. So you've got this kind of guide about what feels good and what feels right. And as Icebreaker has become to be way more than this little idea which I happened to start by accident, having the right blend of vision and creativity with deep sense of ethos and purpose is what is, what is going to determine the future of the company. Um, this is an advertisement. We've got a store in Portland. <laughs> uh, I'd love you to go and try a product. Um, in fact, I'll give anyone 35% off between now and Sunday if you mention this event. It's on, uh, it's on Burnside and 11. Yeah. So that was actually a plea, by the way. That wasn't like that. Me casually dropping it in, it's like, can you please go and watch <laughs> So all of that stuff is great, but it's actually determined by the people. So I want to wrap up just by introducing you to one person who's joined the company just in the last year, who's had a really transformative effect. I thought it'd be great to hear from a new chairman, Rob Fife because he's been a real mentor for me, but also he's not from our industry. So um, I gave Rob a lot of notice. I asked him about 40 minutes ago if he wouldn't mind <laughs> saying something. Um, and uh, yeah, so Rob has formerly been 
uh, CEO, CMO, CIO of a bunch of different companies, most recently running in New Zealand for the last seven years. Um, had a huge impact on me personally. I'm in Portland every six weeks, so I've been flying a few hundred thousand kilometres a year um, for 18 years. So as a kind of, I, had a, I was a keen stakeholder in New Zealand. And the amazing thing that Rob has managed to do, which he's also teaching us, is unlocking the power of the people and how that can have a massive impact in your customers. So Rob, I'd love it if you could share a little bit of your story and also tell us why you're a part of Icebreaker. I, I think the main reason Jeremy wanted me up here was as a demonstration of our uh, diversity uh, policy. I'm, I think, the oldest person at, at Icebreaker. <laughs> so there is life after 50. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought uh, where I could add uh, value is, is to talk about joining an organisation as a new employee. I know a number of you uh, here tonight are just starting out uh, on your careers. I was talking to some woman earlier this evening, I found it quite inspiring just thinking what lay ahead of them. I've worked in a number of, of different organisations and one of the things that drew me to Icebreaker is I guess a shared philosophy uh, and a shared belief that Jeremy and I have and that is that brand and culture are all inherently about people and our relationship with each other, both inside our organisation, uh, with our customers uh, and with our suppliers. And in our case at Icebreaker, all the way back to our relationship uh, with the land uh, and with, with the sheep, ultimately, that produce this fabulous, fabulous fibre that we use. But ultimately, a company is, is, is actually a virtual entity. A company really is just a collection of people. Uh, and so the personality of those people collectively defines the culture and defines the brand. And for the brand to be authentic and to be real, it actually must be a genuine and an authentic expression of the beliefs, the personality, the identity of the people that form uh, that enterprise. So as I looked at joining Icebreaker, for me it was about looking and saying, is this an organisation where I feel confident that I can bring my personality, my sense of identity and be myself and fit within that community and with that collection of people and believe that I can add something uh, to that group of people. And I'm sure Jeremy, in terms of determining would I be valuable uh, to Icebreaker in the role of, of Chairman and working alongside Jeremy, was asking himself those same questions. What is that personality and how does that add something of value and, and context and authenticity uh, to Icebreaker? So the, the key message I wanted to convey there is, is for all of you, particularly starting out on your careers, is don't be afraid of your personality, don't be afraid of your authenticity and your individuality. And the companies that you'll find most satisfaction from working with and being a part of are the companies that actually celebrate and allow you to bring that personality, that authenticity and express it and become a part of the DNA and the identity of that company. And that's what we try and do uh, certainly at Icebreaker and what I've tried to do in the other organisations that I've led and, and been a part of. And so joining Icebreaker and seeing that we had the most amazingly diverse uh, collection of people, you know, at the extremes, the leases at the extreme. Um, and, and then, you know, we've got, we've got scientists that are figuring out how to take this fibre and develop 
uh, greater tensile strength in the fibre to create uh, greater water resistance, to create better odour resistance and so on. So you've got these kind of almost mad scientist characters. We've got fantastic salespeople. Uh, we've got farmers on the land growing the fibre. Uh, we've got marketing people. We've got digital specialists that are building and, and producing fantastic outcomes in e-commerce. Got people driving re retail, coming from such diverse backgrounds, but they all bring a sense of their own personality, their passion, their authenticity and their identity uh, to Icebreaker. And that's ultimately what we value more than the technical and learned skills that they bring to the job. So as we're building our team in, in today and, and positioning ourselves to grow to that next big uh, milestone for us of, of moving from a couple of hundred million dollars of, of sales to half a billion. It's about growing the team with people that actually fit our community, our identity and our authenticity. And if you don't pass that hurdle, then we're not really interested in finding out what your skills are because the personality, the attitude, the sense of projection is, is far more important to us. So that was the only message I thought I, I wanted to convey tonight. It's so important, I, I get fearful at times of how the education system tends to try and put us all in, in, in straitjackets and, and hopefully tonight uh, looking at what's going on in Icebreaker maybe just as a little, uh, a little motivation and message to unshackle yourself from those straitjackets. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just finish with a little story about how we ended up in Portland. Um, so, in Europe, we started in 1999, and it's actually much easier to build an international brand in Europe than it is in the US. The reason is that there are lots of distributors there, and Europe is very used to working with foreign brands. Um, in the US, uh, pretty much all the major brands have the head offices here. So there was, a, we had to work very hard. In fact, I'll tell you what I did. Um, there was a fantastic woman who runs the Australian market called Fran, and she pretended to be my PA, because I didn't have one. So this was in 2001. And we went to the OR show, and we met every single CEO at the show. They all said no, apart from two. Um, so we got two offers to uh, co-develop icebreaker in the US. The guy we chose um, was running a company called Gramici at the time and uh, was an absolute character and fantastically well intended and went out on a huge leap and committed to launching icebreaker not because he needed to or even because uh, he thought it was a good idea, just because he was, thought it was so fun. So it was actually really good because we kind of kicked off um, but then his business went bankrupt uh, three years later. He had the honour to ring me and say, look, this isn't going to work out. Um, I really want you guys to be successful. And there was another chap I met who was living in Sun Valley. So we set up our first US office in Ketchum, Idaho. Um, not the best place to build a team from. Um, I was hugely excited for the first year because it's fantastic skiing and a gorgeous place. Um, but as we started getting serious about the US market, uh, that didn't work. We were also struggling to find talent in New Zealand because design talent around technical apparel uh, isn't the country's forte. We're a bit of a lone wolf. So, um, confronted with this choice around we've got a talent shortage in New Zealand, the skills that we needed, and we've got a stunning but um, quite ineffective office in the middle of nowhere. That's when we converged on Portland. And it was the talent pool. It was a combination of the talent pool and also the sense of place that we have here in Oregon. For me as a New Zealander, I feel quite at home. And even though we've got about 50 people in our Portland office at the moment, that will all grow to about 70 over the next 12 months. Um, there's probably 10 or 12 New Zealanders here, so it's a nice mix. 
and it's just a place where we feel at home. So um, I just want to say thanks to uh, everyone who I've met so far has been so welcoming to me and to the company. And I just feel really fortunate that we put our stake in the ground here because it's a fantastic place. It's the ultimate place for us to build uh, our business from long term. We're still keeping our office in New Zealand. We still keep our offices in Europe. But for us, this is a perfect hub for what we want to do. So thank you very much for having us here tonight and hope to meet some of you after this.